Hey, what's good, self-direct investors? I hope you're all doing great, and I wanna welcome you back to my channel. If you're new here, my name is Jordan. I'm the mind behind Make More Capital, and today we're coming at you with a midweek update in the world of cannabis. Now, before we jump in, if you enjoy this video or you learned something, please just leave a like on it as it really helps out my channel. And of course, if you wanna learn how to take advantage of this generational investment opportunity, subscribe below so that you don't miss any future videos, but then there's plenty of content for you to go back, rewatch, and educate yourself with. I've tried to put all the news and facts in one place so that you can watch episodes over time to learn about the evolution of the industry, identify top companies that you keep seeing pop up, and take Take advantage whenever you feel ready. And we're going to start with this article from Marijuana Moment, highlighting that Colorado cannabis sales dip to 151 million in January, as state data shows. The total is the second highest mark that Colorado has recorded in the month of January since cannabis was legalized for recreational and medicinal purposes in 2014. Last year, Colorado set a record with more than 187 million in sales in January. So obviously, it's down quite a bit from last year's January, but you consider that they're eight years into their market, it's still the second best January that the state has ever seen on record. So I wouldn't worry too much about the month over month decline after a strong December finish to 2021. It does represent though an 11% month over month decline in sales. And that is the steepest decline in sales between December and January that the state has ever recorded according to its historical data from the Department of Revenue since legalizing in 2014. So market's been doing pretty well. And if this is eight years into the most mature market in the US and we've got what 49 other states to follow once they start to reform their laws, Lots of growth to come. As most cannabis was sold in Denver with more than 33 million in sales, and then Arapaho and Adams counties recorded the second and third highest sales totals with 14 million and 11 million respectively. Since legalizing the plant, more than 12.3 billion of cannabis sales has been sold legally in Colorado since 2014. And in exchange for January sales, the state Colorado or the state of Colorado collected more than 28 million in taxes. These taxes come from a 2.9% sales tax on cannabis sold in stores, a 15% state retail cannabis sales tax and 15% state retail cannabis excise tax uh, on wholesale sales and transfers of retail cannabis. So lots of tax there, but also still lots of sales. So you can get a better look from this graph from the Colorado Department of Revenue. Well, I've also got some news from MJ Biz Daily. wanted to report that top cannabis executives to push for federal reform in DC meetings. So we love to hear this uh, updated as of today. More than 20 cannabis industry CEOs are scheduled to meet with congressional members and staffers in Washington, DC this week to urge immediate action on cannabis banking reform and expungement of cannabis convictions. USCC officials said the group will also be urging support in meetings on Wednesday and Thursday for Section 280E tax relief and comprehensive cannabis reforms. We'd love to hear that. About 60 meetings have been scheduled with Democrats and Republicans from both chambers. Section 280E is the provision in the U.S. tax code that prevents cannabis firms from taking ordinary business deductions because the plant is still classified federally as a Schedule One substance. The executives also will be preparing for expected congressional hearings later this year in two on two comprehensive cannabis bills, Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer's Cannabis Administration Opportunity Act, which will likely be dead on arrival, and the U.S. Uh, US Rep. Nancy Mace's States Reform Act, which has a much better chance of passing and actually becoming law, just based on everything that is included. So I wanted to share that, as that is great news. And on top of that, Todd Harrison shared the snippet. So thanks, Todd, for sharing so I can relay it. The National Association of State Treasurers didn't know that existed, but now we do. And apparently they also know, as the National Association of State Treasurers supports common sense federal law and regulations to provide essential banking services to state legal cannabis businesses, promote public safety and financial transparency, and facilitate local, state, and federal tax and fee collection, according to them. So good to also see support from other organizations, especially as we're seeing uh, you know, meetings starting to take place and lots of momentum on this issue pile up. While this MJ Biz Daily article highlights that New Jersey prepares to launch 2 billion recreational cannabis market. This is published as of March 14th. So we obviously know and we're anticipating that in the next few months, New Jersey will launch the state is poised to beat rival New York to the punch and to match, if not exceed, Massachusetts in annual adult sales. And so you can pause to read and just get a bit of a highlight of what's to come in New Jersey. But main thing to highlight, industry officials say that the state's Cannabis Regulatory Commission could take up and approve those applications at its March 24th meeting, but it's unclear how quickly sales would then be allowed to begin. Why? Why is the CRC so secretive about this? Don't you think everyone in the state has waited long enough and everyone just wants to see the industry flourish at this point, especially when they missed their February 2022 deadline and the state simply ignored it, saying it was too early, as opposed to admitting that they're a little too incompetent to do their job right? So I just want to show a little, a few other things that I think are just ridiculous. And while we know that the launch is coming and we hope it is sooner than later, there's just no reason why they haven't launched already. As Ed DeVoe, president of the New Jersey Cannabis Business Association, said current medical cannabis operators have assured him that they have adequate supply to serve both the medicinal and adult use markets. Great, so what is the holdup? 
Also, the CRC has an obligation to make sure there's adequate supply, not just to launch the recreational market, but to make sure that the patient community is taken care of as well, Devo noted. Fair enough. You just told us that medical cannabis operators have assured him they have the supply. So what's the problem? I've been told by the license holders that they are ready, so we'll see. Well, if they can supply the demand, why wouldn't you go ahead with launching so that they can properly supply the demand like they told you? The problem, DePisa says, is that the state's projections might, be, might prove to be inaccurate. No, I think the problem is that a lot of people working in New Jersey, unfortunately, seem to be incompetent. Adding, we can speculate and project demand, but we won't know until the doors have opened. Well, since medical cannabis operators have assured you that they have adequate supply to serve both medical and adult use markets, can you open the doors, please, so we can get the ball rolling? And so at least good news to share from MJ.com is that apparently today, the New Jersey legal weed market is opening soon. Again, just saying what we've already heard, but cannabis industry fired up ahead of a big conference March 16th. And I just got to add, if I was from New Jersey and I had to pay to go to this conference, I would be so angry, especially after all this delay. But with New Jersey opening applications for permits to sell legal weed at retail shops Tuesday and Governor Murphy projecting the market will open soon by adding 4 million in state budget for sales to the month of June. I don't know if it's the end of June, but this would put them in line with launching May 1st, based on what Boris Jordan said and based on what Phil Murphy had uh, adjusted to his budget. Um, bringing millions of dollars in new revenue, the cannabis business community is abuzz with activity ahead of the Garden State Largest Industry Conference Wednesday. So let's just hope this conference is a success and it gets people into the spirit and helps the CRC actually do their job sooner than later and launch this market. Well, we got this one from Bloomberg, so just wanted to share that Bloomberg is talking about New York's announcement that convicts first approach, or that they will go with the convicts first approach to pot draws, and it does raise praise and many questions, but just wanted to share that Bloomberg is highlighting the story, so this is more awareness in mainstream outlets, which is positive for the cannabis plant. So I'm not going to go through this as I have covered it, but just wanted to point out they did also show this guy, Vladimir Batista, who also happened to be the same person that they interviewed for the CNBC article. So they're just sort of recycling the same people and the same story, but fair enough. At least it's making its way through here, so the awareness is spreading. But I wanted to mainly highlight this quote of the week. It would be awfully hypocritical of Senator Schumer to not push through Safe Plus at the federal level, said Camilo Lyon, a BTIG analyst in a March 11th research note. And that note I did feature in my Sunday video, I believe. Lyon said the act, which would let the industry use traditional banking, would give business owners access to much better interest rates and financial services. Now, and he's not talking about the tier one MSOs here, as their balance sheets are fine. He's talking about the small mom and pop businesses operating in legal states across the country, in cash, still dangerously, and the minority entrepreneurs who want to get a start in New Jersey and New York. They all voted for Schumer because of the promises he's made, but Schumer has not kept those promises. So hello, Schumer. Anytime now would be great. And then on to this one from Can Investments. Just wanted to share this article from chicagobusiness.com. Now, I do not have a subscription here, so I can't read the whole thing, but just wanted to share this update as there may be potential progress in Illinois in getting 55 new stores open independent of the current 185 held up by a lawsuit. So this would be a big wholesale opportunity for the large growers in the state. And so hopefully this is in development and I have more updates in the future to share with you. But this is great news just on top of the pressure that we're seeing from New Jersey um, and New York as well. So just wanted to share this one from Politico as at least mainstream outlets are starting to put the pressure on the, on Schumer as well. Again, his budget deal is the latest sign of Democrats' empty weed promises as 14 months after taking control of the federal government, they've done nothing to loosen federal cannabis restrictions. Highlighting on the brink of gaining control in Washington, Senator Chuck Schumer said empathetically in 2020 that I'm going to do everything I can to end the federal cannabis prohibition or the federal prohibition on cannabis if Democrats took back the Senate. But 14 months since winning, Senate Democrats haven't succeeded at changing the little things. So I call bullshit. But Schumer, you've got the rest of 2022 to prove me wrong, so I hope that you do. While Huffington Post published this op-ed from Big Pharma's boy toy himself, Cory Booker, titled, Legalize It, Why Cannabis Reform is a Civil Rights Issue. And look, Booker, at this point, everyone in their right mind knows that cannabis reform is just the right thing to do. So stop trying to make fetch happen and maybe take the first incremental win. So after that first win, we can take more incremental wins and actually see some progress get made. And so it's mostly just more virtue signaling, so I'm not going to read it, but I did just want to go to a few snippets that I thought were worth sharing. Sharing. As after Congress passed the Paycheck Protection Program in the hopes of assisting small businesses during the COVID-19 pandemic, data now shows that lenders neglected and ignored Black-owned businesses. Now, to be fair, this is obviously not ideal, but at the same time, I don't think lenders look at people's skin color as a reason to give them money or not. They really want to look at the person's track record and if the person has a history of paying back any money that they would have borrowed. So that's mainly what they'd be looking for, I would think. But nonetheless, if anyone made some racial decisions, they should be held accountable. But that's besides the point. Is these 
disparities in the banking system have apparently seeped into the growing cannabis industry as well. As he writes, less than 5% of cannabis businesses are owned by black people, with many expressing concern that systemic barriers and lack of capital will prevent them from entering the industry altogether. Are you sure, Booker? Or is it the fact that you have not passed safe that maintain the systemic barriers and maintain the lack of capital so that they can actually join in the industry? Hey, you hypocrite, why don't you try putting your money where your mouth is? So he does finish off by saying cannabis-related businesses need capital to flourish, and I support granting them access to these financial resources. Great. So when will you encourage passing safe, Booker? Can you do it after you introduce CAOA? Please and thank you. That would be great. On to this one from Columbia Cares. They report their preliminary full year 2021 results and announce a revised date for their fourth quarter and full year 2021 earnings call. And so they've changed the date uh, and they're going to hold their fourth quarter and full year and December 2021 before U.S. financial markets open on Thursday, March 24th, 2022. I think they were supposed to actually announce these maybe yesterday, but so I guess they just gave the preliminary results of the year, uh, year over year end total. And so look out for these to come March 24th, I guess. But looking at their full year 2021 uh, using U.S. GAAP preliminary results, we can see their revenue in 2021 increased to $460 million, up from $179 million in 2020, which does represent a year-over-year change of 156%. So that is very impressive. Good job, Columbia Care. Keep aggressively expanding while it's cheap and while you can for a gross profit of $194 million, up from $62 million, which represents a 212% uh, increase. While their net loss did increase to $146 million, uh, up from $149 million, as that, as, the, as that is the cost of aggressively expanding early while things are cheap to try and get a head start. And they're leaving them with earnings before interest, taxes, depreciation, amortization of negative 63.6 million, which is an improvement from last year, though, where it was a negative 109.8. So they did, from my understanding, bring in 46 million more of earnings from operations with an adjusted EBITDA of positive 57.8 million, probably some accounting wizardry here, uh, which is a large improvement from negative 19.8 last year. And so their full year guidance and preliminary results, they had projected combined revenue revenue in between 470 million to 485 and they managed to hit 473.8 so it's nice that they did get in there and they weren't short of that while their combined adjusted gross margins they were anticipating 46 percent they managed to get them up to 45.1 so while they didn't get up to 46 still as close as they could possibly be and combined adjusted EBITDA uh, was 85 million to 95 and they managed to get 85.1 so they just squeaked over uh, that amount and so nonetheless good to see this and I will go through a little bit more into detail the Q4 when Columbia Care does uh, does report. Well, they did manage to hit their projections, but much closer to the low end than the high end. I think it's safe to say a big reason for that is Croptober, as we've learned that this affects all MSOs in Q4 when illegal cannabis in California is harvested and shipped across the country and sold at much cheaper prices to try and compete with the legal sales. And so I will go through some of their Q4 earnings on the 24th when they release that. But nonetheless, at current valuations, this is not advice, this is just my opinion, but at current valuations and this projected growth into the future, if I had more cash, I would certainly open a position in Columbia Care. But again, that's not advice, just my opinion. And I wanted to share this from Todd Harrison, uh, sharing what Camilo Lyon had to say on Cureleaf. Now, many of you may have heard that Cureleaf CFO left the company apparently after only eight months. Um, and so that might be a cause for concern, but personally, I do not think so. Now, I try not to get emotional about investing. And I did see that Boris tweeted saying that the reason that the CFO left is because a tech company offered him 3x the salary elsewhere. And so if he could leave to get 3x the salary, Perf perfectly reasonable decision for that guy to go do that if that's what he wants to do. And so I just wanted to share this as this comes from Camilo saying that the CFO departure is a non-event because while I believe that too, I also don't want to kick Cureleaf while they've been down for months due to negative sentiment that might not actually reflect the truth. And so just wanted to share this from Camilo as he believes as well the CFO departure is a non-event focusing on New Jersey adult use sales as next catalyst reiterates buy with a $27 Canadian price target. And so for anyone that's worried, I just wanted to share this as again, I try not to have an opinion on things I don't know enough about but that is what I do believe based on the situation. And so I wanted to share this from overexposed photos of address. This person is a stock trader focusing on reversals. And so obviously we're waiting for the bottom and he doesn't want to jump in on a trend because it scares him, but he wants to be sure that the trend is going to reverse. So he did share this. So thank you, overexposed photo of address. Notice something, institutions filled up on weed this month. Here are a few of the ETFs. And so this comes from uh, fintel.io, but looking at MJ ETF, MJ alternative harvest ETF, we can see apparently if institutions represent green ownership, that did increase, uh, especially in this most recent month. Well, if we look at MSOS advisor shares, uh, as the price has gone down month over month, we have seen uh, increased institutional ownership, uh, which is helpful for us and anyone looking for a trend reversal because it does mean institutions are buying in now 
when there's blood on the streets. Then we have Pot X Global X Cannabis ETF as well, just shows the same thing, that there are more buyers now than, than ever before. While CNBS Amplify Seamer Cannabis ETF, same trend, more buyers now than ever before. But it wasn't just ETFs, as he also highlights some individual weed names also getting bought up this month, which included TrueLeaf, Canopy, Innovative Properties, and Tilrain. So I'm not going to share these, but you can grab the link below to check it out, while other major, street, major US industry players that haven't been bought yet. He says, I don't understand the reporting for US traded Canadian stocks. I'm still learning. Geez, stop hectoring me. But that includes the other tier one MSOs being Curly, Ferrano, Cresco, and Green Thumb. But just to summarize, almost across the board, institutions own a higher percentage of the cannabis stocks right now than any other time in the past. So that is no Noteworthy. So thank you for sharing this overexposed photo of address. I don't know how well future price correlates, but it's a noteworthy spike. I'm heavy in MJ trying not to buy more as I am and as many of you are. And so this is at least a nice update to get. Well, lastly, just wanted to share this from Todd to remind you that today, TerraSF will report their earnings or TerraSN, not TerraSF, but TerraSN will report their earnings. So that and Air Wellness, I will feature that on my Sunday video, or I might just do a special Friday video to just to cover those two because it's a lot easier than trying to squeeze all that in with all the other news. But then Wednesday, March 23rd, Kirill Thursday, March 24th, Jushi and Columbia Care, and then Wednesday, March 30th, True Leave and Forefront Ventures. So just wanted to remind you that there's a lot more good uh, earnings to come. While well, TerraSend becomes first major U.S. cannabis operator to launch a mobile retailer app on the Apple App Store. Now, I'm pretty sure the parent company did this in California already, so TerraSend might not know that they might actually be the second U.S. cannabis operator, but I guess they might be titling themselves the first major U.S. cannabis operator as opposed to the parent co not being a major operator anymore. Anyways, just want to share that today they launched the Apothecary mobile retail app for Apple iOS devices, available for download through the Apple App Store for customers in New Jersey and California. Users can now place orders for pickup at the Apothecarium dispensaries in Maplewood and Phillipsburg, New Jersey, as well as delivery and pickup orders from the Apothecarium Capitola in California. The company expects to expand availability of the mobile app across Terrison's US footprint of Apothecarium locations in the coming weeks. So there you have it, a second MSO going with the app approach as a way to bring customers in, educate them with product offerings, and retain them that way. So I just want to ask you, are you someone that would subscribe to an app like this or are you not? Personally, I try to stay as far away from apps as possible. For example, I've never used Uber Eats or Skip the Dishes. I like to use my legs and try to keep my memory sharp from remembering things. But just let me know, would you subscribe to something like this or not? Let me know in the comments if you would and why you would. And so on to some state news, as this one comes from the Atlanta Journal-Constitution as competing Georgia medical cannabis production bills advance. But unfortunately, while Georgia was making progress, it seems they're about to take two steps back. Now, I just want to share because this article was updated 14 hours ago and I copy and paste the snippets and that's a way that I can sort of remember what I want to jump to. And so I just want to share what this article started with and what I was going to share yesterday. The Senate voted 52 to 0 to approve a measure that would jumpstart cannabis oil production by authorizing six companies to manufacture and sell the medicine to registered patients. That sounds great. Licenses would be issued by May 31, according to an amendment approved on the Senate floor. But unfortunately, the tone has changed. And so I'll take you through what has exactly changed. Both measures attempt, um, so yeah, lawmakers tried to revive Georgia's stalled medical cannabis program Tuesday, advancing different bills through the House and Senate that aims to issue licenses for businesses to manufacture and sell the medicine, although that's already been done. Both measures attempt to jumpstart cannabis oil production following delays since a state commission announced plans last summer to award six li or licenses to six companies, and they did, that had been awarded, but protests by 16 losing companies alleged the process was unfair, creating a bureaucratic deadlock that still hasn't been resolved. And so it seems as if the 16 companies uh, filed a lawsuit, and for that reason, it has still been unresolved. And so what I had just read to you originally that I was looking at yesterday, I thought that would have been great news. But sadly, they might be taking two steps back as Georgia has allowed doctor approval patients to consume cannabis oil since 2015, but there's still no way for them to legally buy it, which is very strange and obviously the reason why uh, we would want good news. But this is what's happened. The House proposal would restart the medical cannabis licensing program from scratch, discarding tentative awards to the six companies that were announced last year. Well, that sucks. House Bill 1425 passed on a 169 to 5 vote, while the Senate legislation takes a different approach by setting a May 31 deadline for the Georgia Access to Medical Cannabis Commission to authorize six companies that had previously applied for licenses, but not necessarily the six selected in July. So while this new bill was approved on 52 to 0, now they say the sole purpose of the bill is to move the ball forward on getting medical cannabis to the folks on the registry, said State Senator Dean Burke, a Republican from Bainbridge. And I think that should be the goal, to just make sure that you have outlets so that people in Georgia that need medicinal cannabis oil can access medicinal cannabis oil. But then get this, the process, most people say, has been flawed. Really? Is it most people? Or is it really just the 16 losing companies allege that the process was unfair in creating the, bureauc the bureaucratic deadlock? One thing I find interesting is that if you're a company applying for license and you don't win, but then you have the capital to then sue the state for not awarding you and saying that it was unfair, it seems like these aren't people that are hurting for money. So they're probably not minority 
minority entrepreneurs or equity entrepreneurs. Now, I'm just thinking out loud here, but nonetheless, the situation in Georgia is not getting any better. Neither the House nor the Senate proposals would give registered patients certainty that they'll be able to buy cannabis oil soon. So nothing that they're doing now ensures that medical cannabis patients in Georgia get access to their oil sooner than later, while the Senate legislation would disrupt an ongoing licensing process, creating the possibility of lawsuits from companies that could delay cannabis oil production. So basically, the Senate legislation is just going to restart the whole thing, and it's going to create the possibility of more lawsuits from companies that could delay cannabis oil production. It's too bad, because I was very excited to get to the story, especially because yesterday it was titled something different as Georgia Senate passes bill to quickly start medical cannabis program. So that would have been great news, but unfortunately they have changed what's being done there. And it sort of tells me that wokeism has seeped into the Senate, unfortunately. And the only people that get the short end of the stick are the people in Georgia that need access to medical cannabis, sadly. While this one out of marijuana moment as bipartisan majorities in Maryland support cannabis legalization, far outpacing Biden's approval in new poll. As a survey from Goucher College, which was released on Monday, found that 62% of Maryland residents back cannabis legalization. That includes 65% of Democrats, 65% of independents, and 54% of Republicans. While Governor Larry Hogan enjoys popularity in the state with a 65% approval rating, but Biden's job performance approval sits with at just 48%, that's way too high, with only a major of Democrats, or with only a majority of Democrats saying uh, he's doing an effective job. In other words, support for cannabis legalization is 14 percentage points higher than support, support for the president in Maryland. So this is good news, especially as Maryland plans to put cannabis legalization on the ballot in 2022. If we see this, we're most likely going to anticipate an overwhelming yes. While Marijuana Moment highlights that key Pennsylvania Senate committee completes final cannabis legalization hearing to inform reform legislation. And so just a quick snippet of Senator Mike Regan, who chairs the panel, circulated a Coke sponsorship memo last year, along with Rep. Amen Brown, or Amen Brown, to build support for the reform. And these meetings are designated or designed, sorry, to give lawmakers added context into the best approach to legalization for the state. And so this is the final hearing. It is just good to see that they're making progress, as Pennsylvania is also possibly going to have it on the ballot, or they might introduce something before November even comes. And so that would obviously be beneficial for everyone involved. And for Marijuana Moment, as the feds reveal which industries drug test workers the most and least in a new report, highlighting that the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics released the report last month. It also found that a small proportion of workplaces have eliminated or delayed screening of workers for drugs, including alcohol during the COVID-19 pandemic. Well, because a lot of people probably relied heavily on alcohol during that time, and you don't want your workers doing that, obviously. But in 1996, about 30% of all surveyed work sites said that they tested for drugs, while about 14% said that they screened for alcohol. In the new survey, 16.1% said that they tested for drugs and or alcohol. While the survey was sent to roughly 30, 317,000 establishments across the country and received usable responses with answers to at least five of the 25 questions from more than 80,000 workplaces across the country, unlike most other BLS surveys, employers were asked to answer questions online and without the presence of an interviewer. So two of the survey questions asked about testing for drugs, including alcohol. One asked whether the worksite was currently testing new applicants or current employers for drugs, and the other asked whether the workplace reduced or delayed testing since the beginning of the pandemic. And one of the more robust associations the survey found was that the establishments in states with legal cannabis tended, tended to be less likely to screen workers. So obviously, but more data to prove that is eight out of 10 states with the lowest percentage of established drug testing have legalized cannabis for adult use. And among the 10 states with the highest screen rates, meanwhile, not one has legalized cannabis. And so this is the snippet here. And so as you can see, we got a list here of the 10 states with the lowest percentages of establishment drug testing. Two of the 10 are red, eight of the 10 are in green, and eight of the 10 have legalized for adult use. While well, we've got 10 states with the highest percentage of establishment drug testing, all 10 are in red, all 10 test the most, and none of the 10 have legalized for adult use. And so lastly, to end off on some humor, as a UK lawyer dons hemp wig as an alternative to horsehair, disrupting centuries long tradition. I just, why do you need to put the word vegan in there? I mean, obviously hemp is a plant, so you're not necessarily harming animals after that point. But nonetheless, an attorney based in the UK is disrupting the centuries long tradition of barristers wearing wigs made with horsehair. He wants lawyers in the country's highest court to start donning hemp-based head coverings instead. Fair enough, but why don't you start with, you know, ending prohibition? That would go a long way in spreading the awareness and making this a bit cooler. But nonetheless, Samuel March first previewed the hemp wigs last year. He said that horsehair wigs that have been standard garb are outdated and that cannabis-based version could serve as an animal-friendly and more environmentally sustainable alternative to the status quo. Yeah, that's true. But no matter how big your smile is, you still kind of look like a clown, Samuel. But nonetheless, thanks for taking the initiative there. But please, try and push for ending cannabis prohibition in the UK. That would go a much further way. And that is it for today's episode, folks. I want to thank you so much for tuning in, and I really hope you got some value out of it. What did you think of the stories mentioned? 
Let me know in the comments if you have any questions or suggestions, and I'd be happy to address them. But besides that, if you enjoyed this video and you learned something, please just leave a like on it. Subscribe below if you don't want to miss any future videos, and I will catch you on Sunday. No, I'll catch you on Friday for an update with Terra Ascend and Air Wellness's earnings, and then I'll catch you on Sunday for this week in cannabis news. Have a great week, everybody.